Yeah, We're ready whenever you are. Let me do this. Thank you. All right. It's true. Oh, it doesn't okay. say we're on the Okay. All right. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, showing up for the last, actually, the last uh, seminar of the uh, IDSS series for the semester. It's a pleasure to uh, welcome among us today Dr. Carlos Aguilar from MIT Lincoln Labs. Uh, Dr. Uh, Aguilar is a member of technical staff at the MIT Lincoln Lab in the uh, Chemical and Biological Defense System group. Uh, he received his BS from, uh, in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Michigan and his MS and PhD in Biomedical Engineering at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, he was, before joining MIT Lab Labs, he was uh, uh, a visiting scientist at IBM uh, T.J. Watson Research Center and also has, uh, is a recipient of many awards, among them the George Mitchell Award for Excellence in Graduate Research at Texas. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here to talk to us about the, their work on defending against biological terrorism. Thank you for coming. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I've had a, a lot of fun today meeting with some of you and learning about your different research programs. Can you hear me in the back? Actually, uh, it's, it's mostly for the people who are on, oh. on the other side. OK. Hi. So, but uh, for us, you may, you may have to speak up. OK. Um, let me put this. I'm a soft speaker, so let me put this a little closer. So I'm 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 new to the laboratory. I've only been there uh, about ten months now, but I'll detail some of the work that's been going on in our group as well as other groups at the laboratory, and be happy to take any questions afterwards. Um, sorry about being so late too. So uh, just a quick. A uh, bit about the lab. The lab is uh, located in Lexington. We are a federally funded research and development center. Um, we have about 3,000 employees, uh, 1,450 technical staff, mostly about 60% of them are PhDs. We're mostly working with the Department of Defense. I think 90% of our budget comes from the DOD, um, but we have other projects with Homeland Security and other defense agencies, uh, or sorry, other non-DOD agencies. Um, the laboratory, as a unique role in the sense that we are a federally funded research and development center or an FFRDC. But one unique aspect of it is that we do a lot of technology prototyping. So rather than just systems analysis or testing like some of the uh, conventional FFRDCs or national laboratories, we actually have this uh, unique capability in a wonderful clean room as well as a, an engineering group that will transition techniques that the government needs into a very, 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 very fast and uh, unique fashion. So. We have several core competencies. Um, Homeland Protection is the group that I'm in and the, the work that I'll be talking about today. Excuse me, NC State? I'm sorry? Yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, we're not getting your PowerPoint presentation. I think uh, you need to hit send on your uh, video conferencing box. Carry on. Okay. <laughs> okay. You have it now? Okay. No, we're still not getting it. Should I wait or just keep uh, going? No, I, don't, I think they'll work it out. <laughs> okay. Let's not worry too much about that. So I'm in the Homeland Protection Group, but we have a state-of-the-art clean room. We have some people who work with the FFA, as well as the Air and Missile Defense and Space Control Systems, which the laboratory, I guess, was developed for in the 1950s. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about chemical and biological warfare agents. And this is actually not a new thing. It's actually dating back to <laughs> medieval times. So we, we, we learned a lot, you know, about Iraq and weapons of mass destruction and heard a lot about the Japanese and the Germans and what they did in World War II. But actually, biological warfare agents have been used since the 1700s when English generals gave infected blankets to Indians, as well as in the play, you can see them back here in the well, 1300s. No <laughs> um, but over time, actually, these, these, these agents that, are, that have been used uh, for warfare have actually increased in complexity. And as the increase in complexity has, has grown, and as well as the, the use of uh, terrorist agents who can not only work independently from a state-sponsored government, uh, but you know, somebody at home in their basement. Um, so the, the threat has grown not only in complexity, but also in who can, can disseminate these attacks. Um, so often we talk about these two weapons as, 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 as linked weapons, but actually they're, they're, they're markedly different. And the reason why they're markedly different is these chemical agents 
and the way that they're disseminated is, and as well as the way that they affect our body typically interact much, much differently than a biological agent. So every, everybody here has gotten sick with the flu or a virus at one time or another, and those take typically days to if not weeks to, to form their symptoms. And so while our chemical agent like phosgene, as soon as you spray somebody with it, they have an acute and immediate reaction, and that's markedly different. So some of the things I'll talk about today is mostly biological weapons, but chemical weapons are also present uh, in, in huge numbers in our groups or, or defense systems. So we see that they, they, they differentiate themselves both, like I said, in, in terms of how much material you need. So if you had, say, a tanker or a, a huge truck worth of pesticide, you could do a lot of damage to a lot of people. But if we look at the biological agents, you could take, say, a couple of milligrams worth of material or something in a vial and disseminate that into the water or put it into a sprayer and cause the same amount of deaths as a nuclear holocaust. And that, to us, is extremely uh, unsettling. It's, it's why, why I have a job and why my, my group has been growing over the last five years. So it's, it's a tough environment to work in, both from you know, the psychological impact of a biological or chemical event, as well as like I mentioned earlier, state-sponsored terrorism, you know, is, 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 is evolving. It's not something that, uh, I guess, w we're used to seeing. So these are uh, some of the, I guess you could say, the countries that we've identified have some of these agents and such. Um, but like I said, this is not something that, uh, that is necessarily coming from state-sponsored terrorism. Terrorism can be affected by a 13-year-old kid in his basement making explosives. You don't have to be a state to disseminate these <coughs> weapons, and that's what's concerning for us. Um, and that's what increases the complexity and, and I guess you could say the, the ability that our systems have to have to discriminate against. So if we look at the ways that the weapons of, of mass destruction and some of these chemical and biological weapons are, are, are built and disseminated, we, we have something here called the kill chain. And what it is, is it's, it's, it's a progression, basically. You have to produce or acquire these agents. You have to store them, plan them, transport them, disseminate them. Um, infect, and infect and contaminate as well as you know, escape from that, uh, from that situation or kill in that situation. Um, and so listed here in blue are countermeasures to each of these steps. Today I'm mostly going to talk about steps to the right uh, after the dissemination has occurred or uh, after the transport has occurred. Um, but we do have uh, programs at the lab that are looking at the left hand, so looking higher up on the kill chain. So, when a biological attack happens, either through the air or through the water or food, it happens typically very, very quickly. So when you have these, these sensors or detectors that are, that are looking at this environment um, for, for these different types of pathogens, they, hap they happen pretty quickly. And then you have a, a, a small area right here where typically the people who have been infected don't show symptoms or they don't show symptoms that are symptomatic of the pathogen that they were exposed to. So when people get sick with a virus, we don't know what that virus is right away until we do some epidemiology and we, you know, culture it, we, f we see that these symptoms are emblematic of some specific agent. So most of the techniques that I'm going to talk about today are right here in the first half uh, during the environmental monitoring. We notice that um, in this environmental monitoring, we cannot have something that can false alarm, say, every day or even every hour. If we're telling people that there's biological attacks every hour, it'll cause mass hysteria. People will, will flood, um, <laughs> flood system subway, subways. They'll try and get out of town. Um, you can't have these types of disasters be present uh, every day. So we have, to ex we have to work on extremely low false positive rates, um, as well as have an extremely high specificity. So things that, are in the ambient, things that are in the ambient, Bacillus subtilis, which is a direct cousin of anthracis, is, is present everywhere. Um, we all have colds, we all have viruses, these are present every day. So discriminating between one or the other is an extremely hard task, and an extremely hard task to do considering the amount of, of damage these, these agents can do in such a short time frame. So we have a very, very narrow space that we have to work in. Um, and if we look at some of the bioagent techniques that have been conventionally used, which we were talking about today, um, some of the ELISA formats are great. Uh, they, you know, they work efficiently, a matter of minutes, sometimes even a little bit longer to a couple of hours. Um, but these false alarm, you know, they're not perfect. They look at the surface of an antigen and basically dictate an output. So that's not perfect. In order to get to, I, I guess, a better identification technique, you have to look at the genetic sequence. So what differentiates this, this sequence from another sequence? And typically you use that using PCR. Um, but that can take a couple of hours too. 
And then the, the gold standard has just been to culture it and see how it, how it uh, you know, grows over time or a couple of days. So with this accuracy, you also lose a lot of time. So you want something that works in, in a very high format uh, with very high throughputs, um, with extreme sensitivity and extreme specificity on very, very fast times. So it kind of, you have to think about new ways and architectures in which we can do this. And we do this in a graduated format. So this is an architecture that's, that's currently in the BioWatch system, the, the BioAgent uh, warning system. It's called the BOS. Um, and what it does is it samples air. And it samples air through, you can, sorry, I'm. Use the, uh, <coughs> the mouse. I'm just um, okay. So I'll, I'll just use a pen. Uh, so what it does is it samples particles in the air and it withdraws them for five minutes at a time. And what it does is it steps down these particles. And so it, you, you, you see these particles line up in a single fashion inside a column. And then what it does is it, it takes a trigger or it takes a, a system that I'll talk about in a second and it looks at particles individually one by one. And so when this trigger alarms or when it looks like there's a bioagent attack that's, that's currently uh, going on, what will happen is it'll collect more sample. It'll withdraw more of the ambient and then send it to a, a confirmation sensor or an identifier. So the identifier that I'll talk about today is, is, is unique. It's a, it's a biologically inspired um, identifier. And the trigger that I'll talk about is, is, is something that's a little bit less uh, specific. So the goal is, is that you're using this as you know, a kind of, yes, there might be something going on. Let me, let me trick something in here to uh, uh, to tell me whether or not this is, this is happening or not happening. So the, the, the trigger concept is, uh, is based off of UV, fluor UV fluorescence. So as these particles travel down this column, you have a Indy Yag laser that's been frequency quadrupled to 266 nanometers. And what it does is it creates, you know, as, as, as you uh, toss light onto these particles, it, you look at the fluorescence with some photomultiplier tubes. So you look at three different bands. You looked at tryptophan and then some enzymes, uh, as well as the elastic scattering on it. Um, so this has worked typically well. You can identify a, a biological agent from a non-biological agent. Um, but typically, like I just said, you have a lot of ambient where you have biological agents that look very, very similar to other biological agents. So what this does is it just lets you, to a certain degree, um, I'll see you later, Mike. Uh, it, what it lets you do is, is sample the ambient in a high throughput fashion so that that way you can make a smaller decision. And so while the triggers work great, um, we've, we've actually taken these triggers and we've, it might be a little bit hard to see, but we've transitioned them into little field hardened boxes. So originally this was just an optical table, a huge optical table um, that we transitioned with, with some engineering and some physicists into a small little field hardened boxes. So these are now in places where um, I guess you could say we, we consider high value targets. They're around the White House, they're in our subways, they're in our airports. Um, they're in places where you, th you would think a biological attack might occur. Um, and they, they've been fashioned into different formats too. So they've been fashioned into what, what, what's called the RAD or the next generation of the BOS detector. So that uses a different uh, type of trigger. Um, you've replaced the laser with some LEDs. We've, we've got some different formats of this that we've used based on, on government interactions that have said, we need this using this type of technique. We can't have this much power. We need it to be lighter, cheaper, um, not so sensitive, more sensitive, et cetera. So how frequent is this sampling? It happens every minute. Yes. Um, the identifier, though, does not turn on. It's only cued by the trigger. And so there is an algorithm that dictates, um, you know, a decision matrix that goes from the trigger to the identifier. Um, so the, the algorithm is, it's, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but it's a 15-point algorithm um, that tells the identifier to collect air for five minutes and then sample from that air. So the identifier is, is, is based off of uh, leukocytes, or it's based off of mouse beta cells. So beta cells are, are our own body's uh, way of, of, of finding and, and detecting uh, pathogens inside our body. So these have been genetically engineered with the porin and polyvadin antigens decorated around the surface. So when these antigens interact with an antibody from one of these pathogens, they'll cross-link. And what happens is when that, uh, that uh, antibody antigen cross-linking occurs, what will happen is that'll send forward a, a, a cascade inside the cell. So that what happens is you get a calcium cascade that, that happens inside the, cytoplasic, uh, the, the cytoplasm and it reacts with the aquarin. So the aquarin is, is a fluorescent protein that's found in jellyfish. So um, it gives that, that beautiful fluorescence. 
Um, so when the aquarin turns on, what it does is that, that's a signal that is reacted with an agent. Um, this works really, really well with different types of bacteria as well as large viruses. We haven't got it down to smaller viruses, um, but it's incredibly fast and it's incredibly specific. Uh, specific enough where we can come down to 50 colony forming units in, mix in mixtures. And to date, that has not been uh, shown by any other technique. So we can do this in, 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 in extremely fast formats and with remarkably high sensitivities. Um, and so now what we've got is we've got a, a field hardened box too that is specifically just looking at, uh, at, uh, at just the identifier techniques. So what it is here, you can kind of see a, a little CD disc here. So you have some air that is being sampled in through here. It's being sucked down. <coughs> and then we have engineered beta cells that respond to different bacteria or viruses around in an array. And so as it's sucked down, it's spun out by centrifuge into the different beta cells. And so based on this kind of barcode that's generated around, you know which bacteria or which viruses it's been sampled in through. Um, for false alarm rates, it's, it's remarkably sensitive and remarkably specific. Um, it works in, in, in inside a box. It works in conjunction with other uh, detection systems. And so far, the only thing that, uh, that has been the limitation of this is that it's, it's a cell. It needs nutrients. It needs things to survive. So that has been the primary limitation. We've genetically engineered them to live up to six weeks. They currently live only one week. Um, but when you sacrifice that, that, that trade, you, you sacrifice some sensitivity and some specificity with it too. Um, as well as we're, we're taking this, this format and formatting it for, for proteins now as well. Um, so that, that way we can get away from the cells. So, um, Con in conjunction to all of these, these kind of sensors, we're, we have to do some pattern recognition. So these sensors generate a lot of data, and they generate a lot of data quickly. So we have to make uh, essentially highly educated decisions within a, a second time frame. So what's, what's interesting about these pattern recognitions is that when you have a variety of sensors, you have to have more than just a sensor output tell you what's going on in the system. So we've integrated these sensors with cameras. We've integrated them with uh, weather sensing pieces. So that, that way you can tell a person has just sneezed on your sensor. It's not an outbreak or a car just drove by. There's some alcohol, you know. Um, so integrating all of these pieces together into, uh, into detection systems is, is, is something new, actually. And this is what we were talking about. Fusion of, of different sensors together gives you an increase in confidence and an increase in specificity and a reduction in false alarms. Um, although to date, it's, 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 it's actually worked really, really well. Um, this is one example of a highly, I guess you could say, uh, parallel algorithm where you're taking pieces from different sensors and getting them to talk to one another. So you can see you have five or six sensors down a hallway, but getting them to talk to one another is, is, is not easy, as you, as you know that. Um, and getting them to talk to one another where this one can increase its specificity, this one can decrease its specificity has not been easy as well. So what we're trying to do is take a multi-node format towards sensing. Um, and this is just to create you know, increased confidence in systems because no sensors are perfect. There's, there's trade-offs for every system. So this allows us to do several things beyond making educated decisions uh, for sensor networks. It also provides a nice little platform for us to do disaster management. When disasters occur, you have people talking to one another who normally wouldn't be talking to one another. You have firefighters talking to cops, talking to people from Homeland Security. And so this fusion algorithm allows us to possibly take all those inputs into a format and disseminate it very, very quickly to agencies who wouldn't talk to one another. So I've talked a little bit about what happens here after the dissemination and, and past the kill chain. But in, in, looking at, uh, in looking at transport, you, you have several pieces. So each of these sensors or each of these um, detection techniques <coughs> that are protecting against these, these, these pathogens, these chemical warfare agents, these chemical warfare agents or these pathogens have to come in the country, if not be stolen from some laboratory. So what we, we're, we're looking at specifically now is if something's coming into the country, if something's coming in through, say, so these cargo containers or coming in across the border, what techniques can we use to interdict or intercept those techniques. So we've got different programs. We've got what, what's called the trust program. And what this is, is it's, it's a live-in sensor that sits inside every cargo container and monitors and samples the air. Um, and so this is supposed to, I think, take, take effect in 2011. The SafeCon program looks at these cargo containers once they've been uh, unloaded into uh, the port of entry. 
And then the non-intrusive container monitor looks at a broader variety, so not just the port containers. It looks at vehicles, it looks at people, um, and looks at tech. This is really looking at new techniques that can non-invasively detect threats from points of entry where we know people have, say, smuggled drugs or smuggled uh, other agents into the country. So this, this format is new. It's actually something that we're currently pursuing right now. And it, it's, it's actually interesting um, in that it's allowed us to use our techniques in a completely different format. So we've never, say, done sensing through a metal wall before, but now we're using that, uh, that experience to do that now. So in, ah, okay. So finally, um, I don't think this is the last set of slides, but this is a, a, a new program at the lab that has just started. And um, what it is is it's a therapy. Um, Mostly the laboratory has not been concerned with therapies, but uh, what this is is, say, Louis Pasteur here developed it. He got his Nobel Prize for vaccines. Um, so we know viruses, we know bacteria can, can in, in, invade our body. Specifically, viruses can invade our body. They can become more resistant, less resistant over time. So what some of the people in the lab have done is create what's, what's, what they call the DAC, or the, the double-stranded RNA-activated caspase. And what this is, is it identifies specifically only viruses. So viruses, they, it's, it's funny how a virus acts. It's, it's almost like a sensor within a sensor in that it, it tells certain cells to kill themselves, tell certain cells to multiply. It, it, it's, in, it's incredibly sophisticated. Um, but the thing that it does the most is it tells a cell to die. So what the DAC does is essentially mitigates that. It finds this double-stranded RNA that's inherent to viruses and turns it off, if you will. Um, it, it's worked extremely well in mouse trials so far. Um, you can see how much weight loss has occurred for somebody for a mouse that hasn't had uh, this DAC treatment as opposed to one that has. Um, and so, so far, they're, they're trying it with a couple different viruses, um, but it seems promising. They've, they've actually cured the common cold, if you will. Um, so is this, is this an injection or something? I mean, what, what, what is it? Is it, it is. In, in form of what? Liquid form or what? Yes. Okay. Um, so we've talked a little, you know, we, <coughs> I haven't gone through in too much detail about some of these systems, but we've developed a, a pseudo expertise in, in biochem defense that have allowed us to, to get into new markets, new markets that, that Homeland Protection currently seeks. Um, I talked a little bit about disaster management earlier. In Hurricane Confrida, you had a lot of different agencies talking to one another or not talking to one another that propagated this disaster further. So here, what we've done is, is taken some of these fusion algorithms and such and leverage them in, in, in ways that permit these agencies to talk to one another more efficiently and make more educated decisions. Um, a new area that, that's currently my area of focus is, is, is forensics. We're taking some of these chemical signatures and applying it, like we were talking about earlier, to DNA profiling. Um, and then lastly, we're, we're starting to look at explosives and drugs. Um, the IED problem in Iraq and Afghanistan is a growing problem. The joint, uh, uh, what's it called, JAIDO, the joint IED defense organization has, has, has put a lot of money and, and, and an effort towards uh, mitigating the threat of IEDs. And so we've taken a, a small piece of, of, of our expertise and leveraged it in this format. So we look it up here, we, we look at the IED chain, and we notice each of these does have countermeasures too. And so you have facilities and material associated with IEDs. People who need to, people who make these bombs have signatures. Actually, the persistence of some of these these, these nitro aromatic explosives is incredible. The the residues are left on a person for hours, if not in their hair, on their skin, um, as well as in their blood work. So, we can look at that and identify, you know, up the kill chain. This guy was a bomb maker two weeks ago. This guy was a bomb maker yesterday, as well as. After a blast has happened, you actually do have traces of, of, of stable DNA left on a, an IED event, or I'm sorry, not an IED event, on a, on a bomb, uh, both in fingerprints as well as DNA. Um, and then lastly, correlating all of that together, you have suspects or detainees that have been correlated. We think this guy may have been associated with this DNA. What's, you know, could he have been? So what's his DNA profile? So what we did is... We've taken all of these and, 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 and applied them in different formats. And the one that I'll talk about here is what we call a, uh, the ANDI program, the Accelerated Nuclear Detection Equipment. Um, and what it is is it takes a DNA profile, but it takes it in a box. It takes it in a suitcase. So conventionally, when you look at, at, at a PCR or uh, AB3130, a, a separation and detection unit, these are laboratory systems. Um, but what we did with the help of microfluidics was shrink all this to the size of a chip and then 
take the laser and the optics and integrate it into a, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Oh, um, integrated into a suitcase. Um, so now what conventionally took days, if not weeks, if not months, to get a decision for a DNA profile, you can do in an hour or less. Um, and so we're, we're, we're actually taking the next generation of, we're taking the next generation of this and, and trying to shrink it to the size of an iPod. Um, instead of looking at ensembles of DNA, we're looking at individual molecules now, um, at specific sequences, at um, different approaches that uh, allow you to exploit a DNA profile from just a single molecule. Um, and so this is a new program. This is something new that the laboratory has not been involved with before. Single molecule measurements have been typically relegated to biophysical labs um, in industry, I mean, not really in industry, in, uh, in academia. So this is something that the laboratory is growing in. We see a, uh, an incredible amount of potential in this, um, as well as a fruitful area to collaborate with. So uh, in summary, the, the biological weapons I've talked about today are, are a scary thing and they're real threats. Um, as, as you well know, that pathogens do exist and they exist in formats that are, that are non-conventional anymore. It's not no longer, I mean, it's not a, a, a typical huge bomb going off that, that can do a lot of damage to our country. It's something very, very small and something that almost anybody can make. So with that said, a lot of the work that's been done here has been done with engineers, with physicists, with chemists, um, with biologists. And so this, this, interdis this interdisciplinary work you know, requires people with different backgrounds. It requires collaborations. It requires people who are, I, I guess you could say, in touch with this technology as well with what's coming next. Um, and so we've been fortunate to be a part of this. Um, I've been fortunate to just join the laboratory and be immersed in this because it's been a lot of fun. And um, I'd be happy to take any questions. <coughs> sure, go ahead. Do you guys also look at uh creative or advanced algorithms for sensor placement. So for example, for a particular type of pathogen, it might be dispersed in a particular way. What is the optimal configuration or placement of the sensors to optimally detect what's going on? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, yes, we do, actually. There's uh, people in my group who have looked at the specificity of different cost sensors. So the lower cost in sensor you go, you generally sacrifice some specificity associated with it. So what they've done is they've looked at distributed networks of these sensors and seen how it scales down with cost, as well as optimal placement based on you know, weather trends, if you will. So um, like I was saying earlier, some, the, the fusion of, of, of these pieces together is, 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 is really putting these formats into new places and, and allowing us to make better and stronger decisions using the same type of techniques just in simple things like adding a camera or adding some weather. Um, did I answer you? Yes. Great. Yeah, uh, what was your primary difficulty in getting the sensors to talk to each other? Um, I actually don't know. I was not involved in the, in the fusion algorithm um, as well as in any algorithm work. So I, I apologize. <coughs> In the last <coughs> slides, we talked about um, identifying DNA strands. Sure. Excuse me. Um, would the application of that be to identify a certain individual with, like that mat matching that DNA? So I'm picturing like, say, airport security. You walk through the airport, say you have a fake ID, and then you could be identified based on your DNA looking for that person. Is that like where the a direction potentially was going, or is that something that's Technical. So, um, the direction the program was uh, is being sponsored by it's being sponsored by uh, the IED Defense Organization, and their goal is to target people who have been associated with IEDs. Now, Homeland Security is also partially sponsoring the tool, and the reason why they want to sponsor the tool is they have a situation, say, in in, in Africa, and. What happens is, is, this is actually kind of funny, people in Africa uh, who are seeking asylum and allowed to come to the United States can bring with them some of their family members, if not all of their family members. But we learned that these people are not their family members who are coming with them. They're actually selling these, these, these places on the black market. So they were afraid that terrorists might be coming through. So they came to the lab and asked, you know, can we use this box in this format? So what happened is after they did this, actually 90% of the applications to come as family members <coughs> dropped. 
So <laughs> the people, I guess, were not necessarily related to them. So what you can do with the tool with DNA profiling is, is assimilate, or I guess you could say correlate between somebody who is related based on their DNA. Okay. Um, th th there is other formats that the, that the tool we're envisioning can, can play a role. Um, I just haven't talked about them here. How common are uh, <coughs> biological agents to to each other, or or said another way, how how specific is a particular sensor to to a single biological agent or different a few types of biological agents? So the the the, the leukocytes that uh, <coughs> I spoke about earlier, there is they're specifically or genetically engineered to respond to one type. Of, of, of agent, um, but the antibodies on the surface are, are, are what dictates that specificity. Um, so they're remarkably specific um, for for what they are. Um, I think I showed false alarm rates of oh, look out. Um, So in, in, in mixture analysis, where you say throw in uh, Bacillus subtilis or Bacillus globuli, which are simulants of, of anthrax, which are very, very, very close neighbors, um, in mixture analysis with it, the, the canary actually worked incredibly efficient, um, both to <laughs> active colonies per, per liter of air, in, in 20 colonies per liter of air. Um, that's, that's an immense amount of specificity for such a small fraction of, of agents, and that's mixed in with other agents. So it's, it's incredibly specific, um, but it's not perfect. Um, you, still, you, you still see false alarms here. So with that said, you know, the, the gold standard of identification is to look at the DNA. So the DNA differentiates between every individual or every pathogen. Um, so that's why some of these you know, PCR and, and other techniques are, are, are held in better standards. So the next generation of sensors that we're looking at specifically addresses those things. Um, I just didn't have slides on them for, for this. So, so can you identify any potential pathogen which has not been known before? Yes. OK. So. <laughs> uh, d um, I don't know if Canary can do it, <coughs> um, but there are other sensors that, yes, can. Now, in, in your DNA prof profiling, uh, does, does that require a, a physical contact with the, your machine or what? So uh, the way that it's, it, it's currently being used right now is a buckle swab. So I see. Uh, an administrator or somebody using the tool will take a buckle swab and they throw it into a little cartridge. And so the cartridge comes down, it's sealed, and 45 minutes to an hour later it comes out with a DNA profile. You have to have uh, somebody under suspicion to carry out such a thing, right? Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> Um, the, the tool uh, also works off of touch DNA or fingerprints. Uh, you, you leave DNA every time you, you touch uh, some place and you have a fingerprint left. Um, the only problem with that is that you, you tend to have lower confidence in those. So when you, when you amplify pieces of DNA, you need a certain amount of material to start off with. Um, and so when you run this PCR process, you, you start to get false peaks, you start to get into uh, I guess you could say some amplification problems at such low copy numbers. Um, so right <coughs> now it's being used as a reference sample, but the goal is to take it to touch samples or increase confidence with touch samples for the IED events. Um, so for, for your human genotyping or DNA screening, do you use, is it a specific gene that you're looking at or is it the genome that you just fragment with whatever enzyme in your reaction to give you the profile? Sure. So when, when actually when the FBI does DNA profiling, they, they look at short tandem repeat markers. Um, okay, so this is... Short, short tandem repeat markers are, so the way the primers work is it, it, it finds the sequence specific ends of the primers and then we just measure the length of those markers. So. I understand, but do you need to re do you have to have to uh, to pinpoint it to a specific individual? Mm -hmm. Do you need to have a database to screen that against, or uh? the FBI currently has something called CODIS, um, and that's it's a national database of perpetrators within the U.S. Right. as well as there's an international one in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, that's. So you have to compare it back to 
something to right. make sure. So, so the profiles do exist, um, and what they're compared to is, is, is this database called CODIS, C-O-D-I-S. Um, I don't know what the acronym stands for, CODIS. But Grandpa is watching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, I guess that was my next question after hearing that. Do, do you anticipate any type of social or, or political um, issues with having databases of people's DNAs? So that's, that's actually been around for almost 15 years now. The CODIS database has been around since the early 90s. Um, and it's actually the gold standard of what's upheld in court, actually. Believe it or not, you, you can't, uh, I guess you could say, uh, convict somebody without uh, a DNA you know, uh, profile, if you will. Um, so it, it, I, I can't comment to, you know, what the government thinks or what they don't think. Um, but the database is there, and it's allowed us to use this, this tool in a novel platform. So that's, that's yeah, really they have actually, they have one of the largest is in Virginia, because uh, that's what they, the rape convicts, they, they had, uh, they collected all the DNA from the evidence. So, yeah, uh, it has been a database for about 10 years or something. Yeah. I have a question for you. Sure. You said about uh, this. Um, that they are going to put in the port entries that you said it has to read uh, through metal. So mm -hmm. what kind of source you're going to use for that? You know? So we, we've looked at a couple different sources, but the SafeCon approach is to sample air. Um, there is, there's vents on every container. So what they do is they just take pumps and sample air um, and then do, I, I'm not sure what sensor techniques they're using, um, but they mostly look at the, the air that's, been, I guess, inside the container. There are other techniques that are penetrative through metal, um, such as neutrons and, and, and uh, gamma ray systems, um, as well as some of these high energy x-rays. But those don't give you any kind of sensor information. They don't give you any you know, chemical signatures. They just give you a density. So uh, well, the neutrons do give you some kind of elemental ratios, but I don't the know how specific. Are big. I'm sorry? They, they are big. They're huge, and yes, they're yes. dangerous to people. Um, <laughs> So, oh, who <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's, it's, it's a new space for us, and I think some of the problems have been in the signature science associated with, you know, some of these explosives that have very, very low vapor pressures. Um, in order for them to, you know, diffuse through and be in the ambient, you have very, very small concentrations as well as, you know, cargo around there that will absorb those, those materials. Um, and that's not just true for explosives. That's true for a lot of other things like narcotics as well. Um, so looking at the air is, is, is really, I think, what we're seeing as the first step towards a defense system. Um, so that's, is it? They would, they would have to scan. It's a very large volume. A container is a very large volume. It is. The pumps are huge. Um, it's have a lot to of have air. a very large throughput. It is. Um, so and to add to that, too, the, <laughs> the time that it spends on the crane to come off the crane is only a minute. So you have to sample an incredible amount of air um, in a short time frame and then have it be addressed by these sensors. Um, so that's what the trust program is, is, is aiming to mitigate, is you have a sensor that's living inside the cargo container full time. Um, and so it, it'll help in the sense that you don't have to withdraw so much air. You have something that you can pull out from and, and scan very quickly. Um, on the other hand, too, you know, like we were just saying, you, some of these threats don't have vapor pressures that support, you know, a live-in sensor anyway. So, um, but it does, you know, it, it does kind of pose an interesting detection concept in that you have to have more than just one technique come at it. Um, because you, you can't just, for example, withdraw the air. You might need to have something penetrating. You might need to image it. You might need to do a family of techniques to get at, say, the small threat or, or, or the threat we don't know about. So. Did that kind of answer your question? Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions? No. Um, <clears throat> no, but because of the area of a lot of people here, um, can, can you speak to any of the um, signal processing or, or pattern recognition techniques that are used? What are the particular problems that come up? I mean, you, you're, you're having to, to do a lot of separation of, of you know, uh, you know, you know, detection versus false positive type things. And, just wondered, you know, any, anything about how they're used. I, I, I wish I could speak. It, it isn't your thing, I know. At, at, a, at a better uh, length of, about that. Um, 
and, and unfortunately, my, my knowledge of, of the algorithms these people use and incorporate is, is, is extremely limited. So I, I, I would hate to do them an injustice and say something that is completely wrong. Um, so I'm, I'm really quite sorry about that. Um, all right. Well, if not, let's thank our speaker. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Very Sorry about uh, going so quickly through some of these. I, I thought I was late, so I had to speed up. Um, Hi. Good. 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 I don't think that we can do this. Can so did you get some ideas for us? Yeah. Thank you.